Welcome to That Entrepreneur Life, a podcast about entrepreneurship that takes you from idea to launch and beyond. Beyond. Each week, your hosts, Andrew Lees and Clint McPherson, discuss different business topics aimed at adding value to any entrepreneur's journey. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. I'm Andrew Lees, and I got my co-host, Clint McPherson, today. What's up, brother? How you doing? Good to go, man. Just glad to be sure. reunited. It seems like we haven't recorded together for a while. One of us has been flying yeah. solo while the other ones had to take care of business. But hey, that's life, right? That's, that's also the convenience of having two, two hosts on the show. It is a beautiful thing. But so we've got a very special guest on the show today. He's a serial tech founder on a mission to humanize CRM and help B2B businesses increase conversions. If you own a business and you want to close more deals, keep listening. But before I introduce our special guest today, I want to remind you to subscribe to our podcast and to our mailing list through our website so that you don't miss out on all the free resources we have to help you start and grow your business. With that said, I'd like to welcome our special guest today, Yeroon Kothorik to the show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Doing awesome, man. Yeah, great to have you on. So, Yarun, can you take us back to when your entrepreneurial journey started and what it is specifically about entrepreneurship that, that gets you fired up, that gets you moving every day and that just keeps keeps you going, man? Uh, I, I guess I was like building stuff. Yeah, even as a kid, uh, whatever it was, um, I would spend vacation sometimes dreaming about this weird thing I was going to build like a catapult or something and <laughs> it would be so awesome in my mind and you know uh but uh, I, I think where where it's, it it became professional in a certain sense is uh, when I started building websites um I'm a kid from the 80s halfway the 80s and uh halfway the 90s uh the website started coming up uh, and at first, uh, us, the kids at school, we were uh, building these GeoCities websites. I don't know if you remember them. This really basic stuff where you could have this uh, uh, little uh, tickers uh, pass by and little animated GIFs and whatever. Um, yeah. But at some point, uh, I discovered the joy of going beyond that. Uh, I was actually like building actual sites, uh, you could say. Um, I learned uh, Flash. Flash is dead nowadays. But yeah, back then it, it, it was. Oh, I remember the, that. <laughs> it was the hottest thing uh, because you could build really uh, fancy stuff with it. Lots of moving things, um, sounds. Uh, yeah. you know, could be really pretty, um, and it, in a way, it was way uh, ahead of HTML. Uh, nowadays, the tables have turned, and HTML uh, does everything that Flash does. But uh, mm -hmm. you know. Back in, the in, a, day. in a more optimized way too, right? I remember that being Flash, yeah. Flash having an issue with SEO because uh, when when web Flash sites were crawled, it kind of like goes around the Flash components, right? It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the things. And plus, I think what what really killed Flash. Well, the, the first stab at Flash was when uh, it wouldn't run on iPhones anymore because Apple had decided. Well, a Apple had had made these phones that would uh, be. Uh, uh, which the battery would be empty very quickly because it was a smartphone. And at first that, that seemed like a ludicrous idea, like a phone that doesn't, doesn't have a battery that lasts through the day. Uh, but one of the things they had to do to make that happen was to uh, stop supporting flash because flash was super heavy on the processor. Um, but anyway, back then it was flash. Uh, I would be building these things, uh, built them for different people for myself as well. I built one for my mom, for some other people. Uh, and that's when I really th thought like, I'm going to have a business and it's going to be a web agency. It's going to be amazing. Uh, I'm going to make all these websites. Um, and I even was uh, planning in that direction. Uh, I considered uh, studying computer engineering uh, until I went to the open day and uh, it seemed a bit boring. People that were exhibiting stuff were a bit out of this world. Uh, so I decided not to study that. Um, I ended up studying studying electronical engineering, which was the uh, the, yeah. the next the next nerdy thing, I suppose. But yeah, uh, I'm mechanical. Not so as nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's uh, like a, a, on the ladder of nerdy. That's maybe one 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 uh, one rung down or so. Yeah, exactly. A bit then, closer to the world. Yeah. Exactly. And then, then the chemical engineers are like in another 
<clears throat> another atmosphere. They're they're somewhere else. <laughs> Not necessarily nerdy, a little crazy. They got a they got a mix of all kinds of things going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah indeed. So I, I ended up in electrical engineering. I studied uh, business management next to it because I, I always knew that I wanted to do something with business. I sort of felt Smart. how it was like and uh, uh, that seemed interesting. But then in my master's, I did biomedical engineering um, just because I was looking at electrical engineering and we had all these options. So it was going into energy and doing power plants. It was micro circuits, like making chips and stuff. Mm -hmm. Or it was uh, going into telecom and working at some kind of telco, uh, optimizing the network and whatnot. But I, I decided I was more interesting to uh, work on the human body and uh, make technology for that. I've never done that in my life, <laughs> but uh, that's what I studied. <laughs> okay. Uh, because when I graduated, um, they started offering me all these engineering jobs. And I just didn't feel like sitting behind a computer and not talking to customers. For me, the fun of being in business was uh, working with other people, uh, was building stuff for them. And I wanted to do build stuff for them with them, uh, not be that guy in the, in the back in the computer, uh, hearing from the, whatever the project manager or so it had to be built or the product manager, uh, yeah. whatever the title was. Um, and I was really frustrated that I wasn't getting the interesting jobs, at least in my perspective, interesting. Um, so I, uh, at, at some, one evening I decided to apply for business school and that was a good, uh, good thing to do in a certain sense, because after business school, uh, I got a, a marketing job was like on the complete other end, uh, <laughs> mm. in a pharma company, I was in the medical sphere, so and uh, my idea was that I would learn there how a business is run um, because I would have products I would represent and I would put them in the market and all that. What I didn't understand was that my uh, responsibilities would be very, very limited. What I, what I would be able to define was uh, almost non-existent. Mm. <laughs> I could okay. define the brochure and maybe some website if it got approved or whatever, but it was this very, very... Uh, uh, limited subset of the total responsibilities of a business owner. So I, I didn't do that for very long. And where I actually learned the ropes, uh, you could say, is in a, in a consulting company, which is where I worked after that. Um, I joined a company that helped pharma companies to become more digital. You see how it sort of ties together. Yeah. Uh, the websites and the pharma marketing and Smart uh, move. all came together. Yep. And I was one of the account managers there. Uh, I was actually the youngest one. Uh, so I was responsible for finding out what customers needed, um, presenting to them, writing proposals, uh, making budgets, uh, making sure pro projects got delivered, making sure it got paid as well, uh, the whole thing. So it was almost like having my own business, but within a business. Right. Uh, yeah. Which meant that I didn't take the same amount of risk and all that. And I had people to teach me uh, how things were done. Um, and it's there that, that I then got the itch again. Um, I knew that I wanted to start something uh, for myself. Um, at first, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, uh, just thinking yeah. like, what, what am I going to start? What's the best thing? And then right. sometimes yeah. half planning, but never starting anything. And um, it's when I started in the Founder Institute that this gave me the first push to actually start something because the it's an accelerator, uh, which the whole um, value proposition is that if you go through it, you learn all the things to start your business, but you, to graduate, you also need to actually start a business. Otherwise you don't graduate, um, which was my ultimate push to start my, my first actual company, you could say. Um, and from there, I tried many more stuff until landing on Salesforce now. Nice. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, th I think it's, you touched on a, a few really interesting things there from like going to uh, business school. So would you have gone, if you did it again, would you go back to business school? I mean, would you have done that if you did it again? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not the, it's not, I mean, it's useful for me now to have done business school. But it's probably a little expensive if you want to start your own company. Uh, I think the investment is best when you uh, start in the corporate world uh, because 
uh, you basically in business business school the value proposition is that you you put down money they teach you some stuff and you're gonna have a stamp on you and a higher salary and actually what one of the ways business schools are created is uh, they look three years after doing business school what is the the salary increase of a person and the business schools that have the highest salary increase uh, have the highest ranking. There's more stuff that comes into play, but that's yeah. that's one of the very important ranking factors. That's where they um, get their value from. Yeah. So yeah. so if you're thinking about starting a company, probably not the best idea. There's probably other ways you can uh, learn it. But it did give me a good idea of the basics of uh, finance and HR, accounting, you know. Uh, yeah. entrepreneurships maybe to a certain extent so. yep. yeah yeah you bring up a great point there because i mean it, there's a yeah. fine balance right like you can you can go that route which can it, it you know give you that exp- a little bit of experience or knowledge that you might have been lacking which helps but then you're you're looking at also you know what what type of debt you accrue or or the finances that go with it if it's very expensive right where today like the point of entry to start a business as long as you're knowledgeable on, on a certain um, area is not always that high with technology, right? Like compared to what it was back in the day. And so it's so much easier today with technology, the way it is to start businesses. And so, yeah, there, there's that give and take between like, okay, should I go to college? Should I not go to college? Should I go to business school? Should I not go to business school? All these factors that, you know, based on whatever experience, but I mean, I think the transition points that you had to where it was all intertwined or connected to a certain degree might have helped benefit you. But like you said, looking back, maybe not the best idea, but, but you went that route anyway. Right. Yeah. And it, it helps me today. Would I recommend sure. it to someone else? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like we could kind of do a whole episode just on that. I think it's super interesting. Yeah the education side of business, you know, because it's, uh, you, you can learn, you can learn business for free. Uh, it might mm-hmm. take you a really long time. So, you know, you're, you're sometimes trading costs for, for time and learning something in a short period of time. I think where formal education and business school misses the mark is it's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Like, yeah. you know, you're still looking at a few years plus, you know, this, this kind of relatively big expense, you might get like a, um, you know, some percent. Let's say you get a twenty percent uh, pay raise, which would probably be pretty generous. If you took a really good course for just a few thousand dollars online, and you learned a whole bunch, you know, you learned enough to then help you double your sales in your business. That's like a significant in your building equity in a business. Like you're, right? It just like it's. I think the the value is so so significantly higher. Um, unless you want to, like you said, if you want to work, if you want to work for another business, you know, if you're working for a large corporation and you want to kind of like get up to the next, next rung, that MBA might make a lot of sense. Um, but it's going to be really interesting because I think a lot of people are going to, I think, uh, business schools, college, just, you know, undergrad education systems are going to have to rethink the way that they, configure everything in the near future because they're going to get absolutely destroyed by just on just people who are, who know something and who just teach it themselves. Right. Um, the college around here, NC state, North Carolina state university, uh, they <clears throat> I've seen them advertise a bunch for a digital marketing boot camp, And it's mm-hmm. like, it's not a full, you know, like four year degree. Um, I don't know how long it takes. It's a fraction of the cost. So it's not cheap, but it's still a fraction of the cost of going to college. And you can learn all these incredible marketing, digital marketing skills from them because they're realizing that, man, they got to compete with these other guys they online do. who are teaching courses. And so hats off to people, hats off to universities like that who are really starting to figure it out and step up. Yeah. Yeah. And who actually offer courses you can do something within the real world <laughs> exactly yeah that's yeah. also yeah especially if you go if you go in fields like marketing uh, mm-hmm. they teach a lot of weird theoretical stuff uh, but also if you go uh, study something like um, computer software or so uh, yeah. they might teach you these really old languages that i mean it's good to to have learned it to then somehow have some basics but it's 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 not going to be directly applicable, right. uh, and this and this sort of disconnect is 
is uh, is remarkable. Yep. Plus, if you then go out of the 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 university and uh, formal education system, um, you still have to find really good stuff, uh, and that's not easy. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, find yeah. good good courses for a good price. Um, exactly, and knowing who to trust—that's definitely difficult. And then you need also the dedication, um, because you also need to do it right. If you're on a track for college or so, uh, you sort of you're on that track uh, right. somehow. You know, you, you don't yeah. really have a choice almost. Uh, but when you you're choosing it yourself, uh, you need to have this in you that you're actually going to do it. A motivation. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it doesn't give you the same uh, seal of approval almost uh, if you're going to work for someone. If you're just going to work for yourself, it's not entirely necessary to a certain extent because if you're going to raise money, then on the other hand, people also like to see that you're well-educated and whatever. Um, yeah. You're going to have to prove yourself more if you if you don't have these seals of approval. Yeah, and all has pros and cons. <laughs> it does exactly. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit more about Salesflare in a bit. Um, but first, just in general, how can CRM help B two B business to business businesses <laughs> generate more revenue? Uh, in a in a large number of ways, if it works, the most basic way, if you would ask our customers, is uh, just better follow-up of their leads. That's yeah. the, the core answer they'd give you because there's a whole lot of revenue lost just by forgetting to follow up people or not following up at the right time anymore, forgetting what you what you discussed earlier, uh, not guiding them in the proper way through the sales process. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where a lot of things are to gain very directly. Um, but it goes way beyond that because if you have your CRM set up well, then you actually know who your customers are. Uh, well, I mean, beyond what you have in your accounting system, right? Um, you know who you're talking to. You can collaborate well between sales and marketing uh, without making mistakes uh, by building up uh, a database. If you want to call it a list, whatever, uh, with sales and marketing together. Uh, you can have proper forecasts of uh, what what revenue you're expecting to get in, which is invaluable to for the financial health of your business, uh, and so many other things. Uh, mm-hmm. Now most CRMs just don't work, and then you don't get all these things. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and that a lot of that is dependent mm-hmm. on uh, getting your sales team to use the CRM. Uh, because a lot of other things can come in automatically. Like if you're doing marketing and all, it's it's relatively easy to keep the data. Uh, yeah. But if you're selling, then it's relatively hard to get that data because right. you're dependent on uh, humans who re- really don't like data inputs uh, to do the data inputs. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It makes a lot of sense for sure. I mean, I think you brought up a good point though. And this is a friction point for me and being in digital marketing is one of those things is trying to get my customers to understand that their clients need to be followed up with, right? Foster that relationship. It, it is a huge missed opportunity. Um, and I'll just throw an example out there for furniture store I've worked with for several years now to where it's like, you know, I've tried to help them implement things because they don't go through me for everything, but I, I recommend almost like a marketing consultant to say like, look, how's follow-up going? There's huge missed opportunities here, whether it's through email, after they make that transaction, I mean, just think about like it. So somebody comes and buys a couch, right? Or, or a, yeah. a recliner. I mean, bro, they have, they have a house. Most of them are going to have a house, right? Most of them are homeowners. Most mm-hmm. of them have an apart something to where they came in and bought furniture for a reason yeah. and bought for somebody else, but they got a bedroom, right? They got, yeah, they, they got, got they got value. somewhere they sit down and eat dinner, right? I mean, it's like, the list goes on outside furniture. And it's just like, if you're not continuing to follow, follow up with them and let them know what kind of discounts there are, and you're just posting organically hoping they're going to come back. I mean, it makes, it makes life a little more difficult and you're not really um, giving your chance to, to build that relationship that's needed to keep them coming back for more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If they, if they buy a couch, you sort of know what style they're, 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 they're after. 
Yeah. Uh, the couch is probably the first thing they buy for their living room because it's not really comfortable to sit in a living room without a couch. Right. Uh, but then, but then, you know, wives start looking around and they're like, no, I need oh, yeah. a, I need a closet there. And uh, what about that wall? We need something on it. And, right. And and yeah. things start moving from there. So I think guiding them through that process is, is maybe uh, a big win for furniture companies. Uh, going slightly beyond, um, uh, how can I say that, the sort of marketing, the, the latest promo, you could, you could think about like, we can advise you on other stuff that would fit well with this. Yeah. Uh, for your home, uh, we have some suggestions for you. Uh, the sort of concierge, uh, almost uh, right. guidance. Mm-hmm. I think there's a a possibility there. I've never seen a, a furniture store do that, for instance. Yeah, no, uh, I, I agree just, with that. I agree with that. And I, I think Amazon does something similar, right? You buy something that says, oh, yeah. like, recently bought with. And so you could kind of start seeing, okay, like, and I was on there the other day because we needed a a bed frame. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go to Amazon and see if they they ship out bed frames. And they did. So I ordered one. And it was like recently bought with it showed a mattress. And then it showed like the the pillowcase and everything that goes with it. So you can have like a full blown, like the nightstand. I was like, see, I mean, furniture companies, if you're not doing that, if you're not taking advantage of that and implementing that on your website or in your follow up process, that's a huge missed opportunity. So you ruined, thank you for bringing that up. Cause that right there in itself is just a, would be a huge win across the board. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Doing it the way Amazon does it. I think it's maybe hard. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it the would same, be. Uh, the yeah, same recommendation engine going, but if you, if you just equip your salespeople uh, with a, a system where, you know, somebody comes in the store and either you remember their name or you're like, uh, oh, you you bought something here recently. And then you just look them up and then you're like, oh, you bought this. Well, we have we have this great stuff here that goes well with it. So let me walk you to it. Uh, that could make a big difference. So there are a lot of CRM tools out there, right? And I know we just touched on Salesflare a little bit, but why is Salesflare, why Salesflare and how does it compare to other big names like Monday.com? Yeah. So uh, first of all, we don't focus on furniture stores at all. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, uh, we power B2B sales. Um, so that means we serve like Monday.com. We serve a lot of uh, agencies. Um, on the one hand, we have a lot of digital marketing agencies using our software. We have a lot sure. of software development companies, consultancies. Uh, and on the other hand, we have a lot of tech companies. That means other SaaS companies, um, telcos, um, just generally tech startups as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and what differentiates our software from others, this is not just Monday or and also HubSpot or Pipedrive or Salesforce or whatever, is um, we build Salesforce from the ground up to be a system that automatically tracks most of your customer interactions and customer data, uh, which is something we had a huge frustration with uh, when we started Salesforce. So I told you that yeah. um, I, I worked in this consultancy and I started a few businesses. Um, now, when um, I was working with my current co-founder on a, another software company, uh, we wanted to follow up our leads well. Now, we tried some of these other uh, uh, software systems that I just mentioned. Uh, actually, I, I had been using Salesforce in, the, in that consultancy uh, for four years. Uh, and I knew it was really hard to organize myself in Salesforce. Plus, um, I had been implementing it at different companies and saw that even though people came maybe from older systems, very ugly ones, they were first at first happy with Salesforce, but then they wouldn't really use it. Yeah. Now the question is, why does that happen? Uh, and it's sort of a disconnect between um, the amount of work they need to put in and the amount of return they get from that. And how actually, if you don't keep up with the amount of work you need to do, you don't get the return. Yep. And in the in the case of Salesforce, it's even not really built for the end user. It's more built for the for management. It's almost a management reporting tool and a yeah, thing so for your organization to build workflows in. Keep an eye on you, yeah. But then tools like Monday or HubSpot or you know all these others, they are more built for end users, right? Uh, it's actually practical tools. Now, where they still go wrong is that they put very high expectations on you uh, in terms of uh, the amount of data you're going to input. 
Uh, many CRMs have been uh, lightening that workload over time by automating in a lot of things, but in essence, they're still uh, manual data input systems. We've started uh, seven years ago already. Uh, we've started with the idea that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, doing that manual data input. Actually, most of the data you're inputting anyway is in some other system. It's in your emails. It's in your calendar. It's in your phone. It's in some tracking system. It's in uh, a company database or social media or email signatures. All these places hold the data you're actually going to input into the system. So we've built a system from the start that uh, goes into all these places collects that information, offers it to you, uh, and makes that you can really easily follow up your customers with a maximum amount of data and information uh, without you having to do all that data input. Uh, and so that's still the way we mainly differentiate from other CRMs. And now we've started building automation on top of that automated data as well. Like I love that. Yeah. That's been my biggest frustration with CRM so far. I haven't I haven't gotten into it probably as much as as I should. And one of the reasons is whenever I try and use, I've tried a few different platforms over the years. And whenever I try and use it, I end up, it, it's like you said with Salesforce, it, it works. It's nice in the beginning because you see, wow, I've got all this, all these, you know, leads, I've got all these contacts, I can keep everything organized and you organize it all in the beginning. And, it, but then when you need, then you realize that you need to, all the maintenance required to keep that up and keep it all organized is like, oh shoot, I got to keep doing this. I got to keep doing, you know, maybe even like an hour or more a day just in managing a CRM. Like you said, it it makes no sense. So actually that's one of the first things that jumped out at me about Salesflare is that it does automate. Like that's just, that is, is reason enough, I think, to to give it a shot because you know, like you said, if it's if you've got all this information out there, you you have to manually dig around for it. It's going to take forever, but if you have it, that process automated um, saves you so much time to where you can actually focus on delivering your service or product to your customer. Yeah, and it's only also the only way. Like we we discussed the benefits earlier of uh, CRM, like better follow up uh, first, so you make more sales, and then all these yeah. other things. Um, it's all theoretical uh, benefits from a CRM that are most often not realized mm -hmm. because people just don't use the CRM. So you set up a yeah. system to get to get all these things going, yep. and then maybe for a bit uh, you do it, but at some point you start uh, slacking a little. And you're like, oh, you know, I won't input yeah. as much now. And then not everything is in there. And then you're like, oh, not everything is in the CRM. So it's not really useful. And then you input a little less. And at some point you just stop. Mm -hmm. um, it's just because if you don't feel that what you're doing at that point uh, benefits you directly, uh, it's easy, uh, then at some point you're just going to stop. Uh, and we try to maximize the output, like the amount of data you have and how much it it helps you sell and all that while minimizing that input. So it, it's it's way easier to uh, to keep using it. I'm not saying that no that everybody keeps using Salesforce all the right. time, yeah. uh, but I think we're way more successful than uh, than most. Um, of our revenue, actually, uh, ninety percent comes from active users, uh, okay. which uh, I think in Salesforce is more probably more like twenty thirty percent or something. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. And that speaks huge for what you got going on over there. And I just think, again, like you said, I, I've worked with several companies that that invested in these these other platforms. And again, like the maintenance that goes into it or just as, it starts getting time consuming. And once you fall behind, right, mm -hmm. then it's like you don't even want to put the effort into do. That's why they just totally quit using it, because it's like yeah. I don't even have time or want to put the effort into going back in here and catching up or. You know, they start dropping the ball too much and it's like completely like, OK, I'm just going to go away from this. And I was managing for I was helping uh, manage some digital marketing for a company and they were using HubSpot, man. And they were like they had the max plan and they weren't even tapping into like 25 percent of what like it was doing at the time. And I'm just like, guys, you know, like you could spend a little <laughs> bit more marketing, you know, over here, because right now what you're doing with the, you're wasting a ton of money getting like the elite plan through HubSpot. You're not even tapping in any of this stuff. And it's just like, it was just mind boggling the figure that they were paying because I would talk to him every once in a while and he'd tell me and I'm just like, 
what are you thinking, dude? Like if you're yeah. going to pay that money, use it wisely or hire a staff that can manage and tap into everything that HubSpot can do for you because it's a huge missed opportunity. Right. And so I just think, again, some of these people get into these things and they think it's like you said at the beginning, it's like the shiny object and they're like, oh, they're excited about it. And then it just fades. But for you to be able to keep that 90 90 percent, you know, active user rate for, you know, most of your income, that's huge, man. And that that right there, like you said, when when other companies might be sitting at 20, 30, that, I mean, uh, that in itself means that you're doing something right um, with sales player in, in, in itself. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty painful when you see some investments and you see the Oof. usage of it. Mind boggling uh, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Upspot is a very expensive example. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that makes a lot of sense. So kind of want to switch gears a little bit and think about like we've been talking about what how, you know, CRM is can be helpful for a small business, for entrepreneurs, you know, how you can especially if you're selling B2B, how you can leverage CRM to really maximize sales efficiency. But let's talk about um, actually building a tech product because you build a couple of them. And, uh, you know, there might be some people listening who are interested in in building like a, a SaaS product or some kind of mobile app or something. You know, what kind of, what was that like for you? And what's most importantly, especially for like a bootstrapping startup, what's the best way to validate your idea and quickly start generating revenue? If, if I would start all over again, uh, I think the following would be the process. Uh, so I, I get an idea. It's probably because I encounter something myself. I'm like, why is this sold like this? I think this can be done in a better way. The, the first uh, reflex you'd probably have is like, I'm, I'll just build something and then but actually, before doing that, I would say, take a step back, uh, interview maybe 30 or 40 people, which you think are the target market for this. But you can also go slightly around it. And uh, the easiest way to get those people is probably by uh, finding them in your own network. Um, and then if when after you have the interview with those people saying, like, do you know any other people like you, which I should interview for sure. Uh, but you could also find people on LinkedIn. It's probably a bit harder to get uh, to get them to uh, invest time uh, into this interview, but it's a possibility. Uh, but then really dig into everything around the thing you're trying to solve. So who are these people? Like for me, for instance, uh, so they're selling. How do they organize their sales? Uh, what's the place of software in that? Uh, what types of software do they use? For what reasons? What does that power? What's going wrong with this software? Uh, and really understand that picture. Um, then try to figure out whether they have the issue that you are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and try to validate whether they think that your theoretical solution uh, would be a good one. But just asking that right off the bat is probably a bad idea because they might, might just say, yeah, 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 that sounds amazing. But... It's, yeah. it's good to know everything around it too, so that you can also judge whether it would actually be amazing for them. Yeah. Um, as you will notice, uh, people will often say that it's uh, that is great and all that, uh, but the only real validation, of course, is is getting them to pay for it. If you have something simple that you you're going to build, then you can ask them, uh, "Could you put some money on the table and we'll build it?" Um, Many SaaS products uh, are probably not that simple. And then you probably uh, have to build the simplest version of it first, mm -hmm. uh, as they always call it an MVP, minimum viable product. Uh, get that back to your users, get feedback, uh, build that into a minimum usable product, you could call it, something they actually want to use. Not yeah. just like, oh, that looks great theoretically. <laughs> Right. Uh, but but something they 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 find okay. themselves using. Yep. Yeah. So they can. It goes beyond just the theory of like, hey, if I built this, would you use it? Would you pay for it? But then here's what it is. Here's what it'll look like. Here's how it will set, help you solve your problem. You know. Yeah. Are we are we now still on the same page? I, I think like the, the the very first version shows what it does. Right. But then mm -hmm. then the second version. Uh, should go towards uh, making them use it. 
if people don't use a SaaS product, uh, then they're probably not going to pay for it. So I think you can, in the beginning, you can give it away for free or very cheap at least, uh, mm-hmm. and and make sure that it's something they 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 use. And then from there, uh, you need to figure out what what would make them uh, pay for it. Like what extra stuff do I need yeah. here to really offer that value? Uh, and that's then you go to a sort of a minimum sellable product. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's all like in the beginning, you need to be obsessive about this process. It's really uh, finding the right people, uh, right. trying to figure out who, who the right people are at the same time. Uh, talking to them, understanding their needs, understanding how you can make the product better to mm-hmm. take that next step. Uh, be very, um, how can I say, uh, uh, spend a lot of time with the customer. Don't put up some sort of trial page where they can do it all themselves and then try to look at the videos to figure out <laughs> right. what they want. I mean, you're never going to see that. You're going to see some uh, some embarrassing things going wrong, but you're not, never going to get the whole depth of the experience uh, and miss out on a whole lot of feedback. So make it a very labor-intensive uh, a process almost, non-scalable in the beginning, but try to get uh, your product to the next step and to the next step. Um, and then from there, when you start figuring it out, it's... It's all about strengthening it. It's all about making the onboarding better uh, so people can get started in a more easy way. People understand things better. There's more functionality that strengthens your value proposition. Uh, It's about building new plans to uh, make some more money off it and and so on and so on. Uh, But it really starts with a very, um, how can I say, non-scalable you and the customer uh, kind kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. to a machine that uh, in the end uh, that uh, automates all that and where you I think ideally yeah. still stay close to the customer uh, but you uh, make yourself as un- unneeded as possible at least yeah I mean that's that's what we should all be working towards as, as business owners right is sure is taking our, ourselves out of the equation besides just being the owner of the business Cause that's when you know, you've got a, a true business and not just, and you just haven't created a job for yourself. So, uh, but I really like that approach where you just start it kind of manual and you're working through things with your customers. So you're figuring out what do people really need? And then you're making it a lot more efficient as you go. Um, physical products have crowdfunding for, you know, to, to raise money. I guess you could really, you could kind of do that with an app too, although you see it use a lot more for, for physical products. Um, and that helps you generate some revenue directly from your customers in order to pay, in order to actually pay for manufacturing and marketing and actually launching your product. Um, and so you don't need, you always need to invest something into your business to start. You can't start a business with $0. It's just impossible. Right. But you can with crowd. What's cool about crowdfunding is it allows you to really, um, instead of getting a, a bank loan or instead of going to investors or friends and family or whatever, it, it helps you get money directly from the customer without having to have a physical product made. I wonder if there's an equivalent of that for for SaaS and app products where maybe you offer like what do you think about offering like a lifetime. Pro- program, you know, so if you have a, yeah. a pay per month thing, you say, Hey, for hundred dollars or $200 or whatever it is, instead of paying month after month after month, you, if you block this in now, before this is ready, you get this lifetime deal. Then you use that cash to go develop right. and build out your app. Is that something that that's doable? That's it. It's, it's definitely the, probably the best thing. Uh, For sure. It's what I was thinking when you were talking about the whole crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the, the closest thing, but still you will need a product uh, when you do the sell the lifetime deal. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be very hard to sell a lifetime deal without a product. Uh, yeah. So, so you, you still will have to already... invest in that MVP or something, exactly. something to show what, right. what the heck you're doing. Yeah. But, uh, the the advantage of doing a lifetime deal is well partly you get that cash 
if you do it through parties of like AppSumo or something, you're only get, going to get a, a piece of that cash. Uh, so the, the cash is not going to be huge. Right. Uh, it's nice, good money, but it's uh, it it won't finance the whole process or so. Uh, mm-hmm. What is really nice about it though is that you um, you can see it as free marketing almost um, yep. because you get a lot of people on your product uh, that and that you should try to make them excited <laughs> about the product. Obviously, they will recommend it to other people. Uh, you will get a ton of feedback on your product. Um, mm-hmm. You will have a lot of people that can review you on review sites, uh, yeah. all those kind of things, uh, which yeah. otherwise takes a whole lot of money um, to to get. Right. And in this case, you get paid for it. You can you can look at it like that. Of course, uh, the the flip side is that you uh, also need to be able to pay to maintain these people on your product. Because they pay once and then they use it forever. Uh, you'll have to support them. There's probably hosting costs involved, maybe other technology costs uh, that are variable and running. Yeah. Uh, so you can only really do it if if those are limited, of course, or if you can, sure. you can easily cover them afterwards with the with the with the extra revenue you get. Mm-hmm. Um, upselling after a lifetime deal is pretty hard. Uh, well, yeah. it depends, of course, on the on the audience, but you're mostly going to sell lifetime deals to a, a sort of lifetime deal audience. Right. Um, and these people expect that um, it's really a lifetime deal and that they pay once and then use it forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if at any point you say, okay, now this, this is all lifetime, but then this is subscription next to it, or right. whatever, <laughs> yeah. uh, they're, they're not super likely to accept that. Yeah. Actually, we did we did a lifetime deal uh, four years ago on AppSumo, mm-hmm. um, and what we offered was uh, one user free and and other users at fifty percent off, and that was a relatively okay way to also still get some upsells, okay, um, because they knew the deal from the start. Right, yeah. they knew that it's, is that one one guy uh, using it for free, and then if you want colleagues, you pay extra. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. you still lock them in, but you don't, you don't eliminate the the ability to upsell them at, you know, down yeah. the road, kind of don't pigeonhole yourself um, into yeah. like taking less cash. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. The, the good thing about lifetime too, is you should assign a drop dead date, right? As far as like it drops, this lifetime value is only good for a certain amount of time. Like I'm yeah. trying to build yep. my user base up. So I can get the feedback because you can make quick pivots then, right? You're getting feedback, you're adding, you're give, possibly giving a roadmap for people to go to, to the, your actual website to follow. And, and then mm-hmm. like a checklist is saying, okay, complete, complete from user feedback. And you can hone that thing in and get it as a, a, a fine tuned, well old machine to where like not only is your lifetime members excited and they were the ones that actually got a hold of it and, and they're taking advantage of the lifetime deal, but now you know, once that thing drops dead to where it's like, okay, now we're going with a monthly subscription or whatever. So you don't pigeonhole yourself entirely because the people that throw the lifetime deal out forever, it's just going to bite them in the butt eventually. So you got to drop, you got to, you got to let that thing go. So you can continue to mold things up. I've, 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 I've never seen it before. The sort of lifetime deals that ends, Uh, but it's something that could definitely be tried. Yeah. Maybe it works. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> so you I, I believe we can talk to you all day, man. I, I love, uh, you know, what the knowledge and expertise you bring to the table, but if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, it could be, Hey, go out and check out sales flare today and go grab, you know, get in this thing. <laughs> but, free trial. but what would it be like some actionable advice you possibly can give to our audience that they can leave this episode and, and jump on? I would say, um, if you're someone who, who wants to start a business, um, then the most important thing is to start something now. Uh, I mean, not next year, the year after or whatever, uh, but to get started on something. And it could, could be something small. Uh, it could be something stupid in the end. You might find mm-hmm. out that it's nothing. Uh, of course, don't take huge risks. Uh, don't uh, just quit your job or... Uh, spend a whole lot of money to build something or whatever. 
but try to be scrappy, uh, do some stuff after hours, maybe go part-time at your job and just start doing something because the easiest way to get started is to, to get moving. Uh, if, mm-hmm. if you're not in movement, it's very hard to, uh, to, 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 how can I say, if you're not already mo- moving, it's very hard to start something. Um, yep. and you're not, you're not going to start the perfect thing the first time anyway. Uh, but when you're moving, you'll see stuff that you think could be better. Uh, and that will be the, the start of a, of a new company based on something you've, you started previously. Um, so I, yep. I, I'd say just, just get going on something. Love it. Uh, amazing advice. Yep. Yeah. So, well, guys, I think that's a wrap for this episode. And from the both of us, your, your room, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day and adding value to what we're doing on our podcast. Yeah. Thank you guys. This was fun. Yeah. It's been a real pre- pleasure. Your Thank you all so much for listening to that entrepreneur life. To learn more about what Yeroon is working on, check out salesflare.com. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our podcast and don't forget to download our free ebook about the success mindset at thatentrepreneurlife.com. And thanks for continuing to support what we do as entrepreneurs. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. Thanks for listening to That Entrepreneur Life podcast. Be sure to visit thatentrepreneurlife.com to join the conversation, access our show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode as we continue to add value. Until next time.